Hello Africa, my name is Bosso Ayemi. You're welcome to Digital Africa VIP series. It is my honor and privilege to invite our guest. I'm a director at Digital Africa and this VIP series is brought to you by Digital Africa. Today, we have a very, very, very important leader in the African FinTech space, uh, Mr. Mitchell Elebe. A lot of people call him Mitch, for sure. He's the founder and CEO of Intersuite. He is a graduate from the University of Benin, an alumni of Lagos Business School and ISA Business School. He is a fellow of the Desmond Tutu Fellowship. He is an awardee of the Forbes and CNBC uh, West Africa Business Leader Award in 2020, 2012, and Esther Young Entrepreneur of the Year, an Harvard Alumni Business School Nigeria. Uh, Entrepreneur Leadership Award for General Management in 2015. Ladies and gentlemen, most importantly, Mitchell is widely acclaimed to have founded and successfully managed into Switch for many years. Mitchell, a pleasure to have you here. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Glad to be here. Okay. Th thank you, Mitchell, for, for accepting our, our invitation to, to do this session. And we're also happy to do this in your office. Uh, it, it's, it's great to have to do a physical interview after the so many months of uh, virtual meetings of uh, COVID. I, I'd like to start by really, really introducing people to you. Uh, yes, a lot of people know you uh, across the continent of Africa and in the world. But it would be nice to have a bit more about your background. We're focusing today about your startup journey and life. But tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, yes, we, did, we just mentioned that you're in Uniband and you did a lot of things running through your career. Yeah, thank you, Basu. Uh, where, where do I start from? Studied engineering, like you already said. Um, family of four. Um, I've got three sisters. I'm the last born the boy. Um, grew up in different parts of Nigeria, mostly Benin City. Uh, Ibadan, and of course later in my life Lagos. Um, I've always been intrigued by the people of Africa. Uh, I've always felt that uh, as Africans we deserve better in many areas. And so as a very young boy growing up, I've always felt the need to change a few things, okay? As soon as the opportunity came. So from being a student in Western Benin, I've always been dreaming about only businesses that will have huge impact, impact from the point of view of creating jobs, even people in place where they can really express themselves and be the best that they can be. And uh, interest which gave me that platform. So it's been almost 20 years now uh, running into switch. The company in itself has made lots of impact. Uh, I've developed a certain individual and uh, we're, we're here today. So, so Mitchell, what you're saying is that you're not an accidental entrepreneur. You you set out deliberately, you knew way back that this is what you wanted to do. Sure, sure. So after that, after my secondary education, uh, while waiting for my jam result, I wrote an article why business firms failed in Nigeria. It was published in what used to be the sketch newspaper many years ago. Then I was in the battle. I, I was intrigued by if you're going to run a business, one of the first things you must know is why the business is fail. I have this view about life that sometimes you do not know what to do, okay, the right things to do, but you must know the things you must not do. So I started my journey trying to find out why do businesses fail, not necessarily why they succeed. If I knew why they fail and avoid those things that lead to failure, there's only one thing you can achieve, which is success. So I spend a lot of time trying to understand why companies fail. I try to look at companies that are not doing too well, why they're not doing too well. And then from there, when the opportunity came to be the test, which it was clear, some steps that we must not take. And I basically avoided those steps. And if you avoid the steps you must not take, they basically means that you must be taking the right steps. Hmm. It's interesting. Uh, I wouldn't take this question now, but I have to. As a very young man, early on in life, you figured out why businesses fail. 
do you want to remind us of three of the most important reasons in your view why businesses fail? Because this is important for startups. A lot of startups set out, as you know, all over the world, the, the best regions will have a 15-20% success rate for startups. Okay, thank you very much. So yes, I can. Uh, three, I think the biggest lesson for me was your business model. Um, what is your business model? People say your business model is your secret for making money. So what is that thing you know that nobody knows that puts you ahead of every other party to make your business stand out and make money? So looking at your business model is very critical. And your business model is neither right nor wrong. It's right or wrong relative to the environment you're in, relative to the time you're in, as well the kind of competition and opportunities that you have. So I've never felt there's either a wrong or right business model. I've always felt for the current season, will this, will this, model, will this business model work? If you look at industry, for example, we've had to change business model like three or four times. Because as the market evolves, you don't have to recognize that you have to change or something else, okay? So business model is number one. Number two is leadership. What really do you stand for as a leader? Now, leaders, I see leadership as built on two pillars, okay? Pillar number one is the ability to organize things, to get things done. We all know that. We can go to school, read about time management, organize to get things done. The part where most leaders fail is the other part, which I call the area of motivation. Okay, the ability to free people to do willingly and well, whatever they need to do. So I noticed that most companies fail, not on the basis of being able to organize things, but being able to galvanize their people to do things. The CEO may not be there, but the managers should know what to do. The funder managers know what to do at any point in time. Okay, so they take the opportunity that they see and they just do it. So the ability to free the organization for people to do things willingly and well is one of one other reason why I, I believe people um, most most companies do well. The third one is money, capital. Now most people think you you need money to start a business. Yes, you do. But what most people don't know is that money is like blood. Okay? If you have too much of it, it's not good. It's dangerous to your health. If you have too little, it's not good either. So having that balance of money and taking the right decisions so ensure that you get a good return on whatever investment you are making is critical. So if you ask me for my top three lessons, those are the lessons I'll give to you. Uh, the business model, the leadership style, and of course, the role of capital in the business. money and blood because I uh, b before this session started you did share your views with me around startups and capital we'll, we'll come back to that and those who know you know you're a very sociable person and, and your presence on social media uh, <laughs> also speaks a lot to that isn't it yeah. uh, yeah. your your handle on, on most platforms is uh, mystic switch yeah Ask that pronounce exactly and what's the basis? Where is that from? It sounds mysterious. So what, what's the story? Okay, so when I started getting involved with social media, I wasn't quite sure I wanted to be on social media. I'm a very private person. So putting my life out there was not something I was looking forward to. But I knew from the kind of business I do that I could not ignore social media. So I wanted to be there and not be there. So I thought the way to be there was to use a name that nobody would link to me, okay? At least to get a feel. So just become a monetary spirit of some sort. See what's going on, <laughs> but not get involved. But um, recently, I think when Facebook and uh, Instagram came together, I basically had to synchronize things. And then I had to put the, right, the, the name, <laughs> that is the name. So go back to your question, it's Mystic Switch. Mm. And the way I came about it was, of course, you know what switch is. Mm. I wanted to move, move things up and down. Okay, uh, mystic, mystic or mystic, two different things. Okay, but the one I went for was the one that tells you that this is a bit different. Mm. It's, there's some, it's, it's it's here but it's not here. Mm. Because like I said, I wasn't quite sure <laughs> what I was in on social media. Mm. So the name just stayed with me and that is how I kept the name Mystic Switch. Mm. Yeah. Okay, nice, nice. Uh, 
I think eventually your, your social media experience is strong with a lot of following and a lot of nice life lessons you share there. Yeah, one would observe that lately your journey and your stories are getting more philosophical on, on social media. What, what's going on? Okay. The age thing? Or, of course, the age or, thing is or, there. Change your but perspective? It's a combination of many factors. Age care is one of them. Um, recently, I began to question a few things about life, okay? I've always done that. I mean, I've always been that kind of prospect. In the last few years, you begin to say, okay, um, interest has done very well, but what kind of impact have you already made? So I began to share things that I think are important, but I don't want to put it in your face. I see a lot of things young people do on social media, and I wish they, they, they knew different. So some of those things you see, it's just me expressing certain things I hope that if they read, you know, I'm not criticizing you, but if you read it, think about it, it may tell you something. So that has been my mood mm. in, in recent times. I just put things that I feel, for those who want to read it, it will force them to think, and when they think, they will begin to see maybe a slightly different way of approaching things. Okay, let, let's come back to your startup journey, uh, and that, that's really why we're here. We all know about, well, a lot of people know about your into switch journey. We we'll, would we'll, uh, look a bit more closer into that. But, like they say, it's not always the first attempt that you strike gold. Um, have you had other projects you have started, or you before or after into switch? not as successful because when people see you all they see is success it's always the good story so there has not been anything i have done that has failed but there are things that i have done that have uplifted their usefulness and i've done them mm -hmm. and i just show some examples as a student to uniben not having enough money i had to do some business so I used to joke that I go to lectures Monday to Thursday, the Friday I start to do business. I use Sunday to catch up on what I missed on Friday and I repeat that cycle. If I break that cycle, there's a likelihood that I may not be able to sustain myself in school, that kind of thing. So I was in business then, but the business was business that should not make me lose sight of why I was in school. You know, there's this called the activity trap. Don't get so involved with something that you forget the reason why you started in the first place. I didn't go to school to be rich. I didn't start business in school to be a rich man. I started business in school just to get enough to complete my degree and come up with a good degree. The moment I finished that, that business was done with. I let it go. Okay? So that was the first one. And then phase two, you know my story. I was with Telnet, left Telnet, went to Slumberger, came back, and I started to try my hands on entrepreneurship again, which I started doing. You know the days of uh, data networks and it was going well the one day i realized that i was bigger than this vision we had money in the account i had a chairman i think then uh, that should have been early that should be 99 yeah 99, 99 2000 yeah. yeah i just called my partners i told them i was leaving they said why i said mm, i want to do something else this is not exciting me anymore you know so i think if i recall we left out of five million in the account then left it, left the computer, left the office, left everything, I just walked away. And I went back to paid employment because I knew what I knew then was not enough to take me to the next level. Mm -hmm. I started out too early. Mm -hmm. I needed to go back into working for a company and learn the ropes. So I could have been okay just getting contracts here and there, doing them, but it was not going to scale. So I needed to go back into a paid employment, work for an organization, understand how structures are created, how companies are run, okay, mm -hmm. the processes you have in place, and then attempt to launch that again. Mm -hmm. So again, you said that that business, I would say it failed, it has not lived its usefulness. It made me realize that I came out too early mm -hmm. to start my entrepreneurial journey. I needed to learn a bit more. Mm -hmm. So I went back to learn. And after I learned, internship became the next one. Mm -hmm. So the question is after internship, what next? I, I, that would be the best logical question. I can tell you what next, uh, because I've been thinking about it. It has to be something not bigger. It has to be something that will keep me excited for the next 20 to 30 years. It has to be something that will make more impact 
than it has had made. And it has to be something that will find a lot of young, talented entrepreneurs who do not have the opportunity to launch out. Discover somebody who has a certain experience, who believes in them and is willing to back them with his money. So if you know, I tell people that I'm the product of the benevolence of others. With this that internship, I didn't put any company into it, which I had no money. So people believed in the dream and supported, both financially, some of their time, energies and the like. So I just feel that at that point, if I have made some money, I need to look for the Mitchells around and also back them the way I was back in my time. And this I want to do it on a grander, more grandiose scale. Hmm. So that will be the next day, but again, time will tell. Time will tell. But before we look forward, let, let's look back a little bit. You, you, you just alluded to how you started into Switch and you made a lot of very interesting points. Young people getting ready, being prepared. You, you realized early on that you were not ready for the scale and, and the level at which you want to play and, and you decided to work out your way of acquiring those skills and then you relaunched. Uh, a lot of young people jump straight out into entrepreneurship uh, and, and starting up businesses. Do you think uh, most people are prepared enough? What, what skill set do they need to have? Do they need to take their time? You know, uh, especially in the past of Africa like Nigeria, there are a lot of things uh, young people say, we don't have time, no time to waste time, we don't have time for time, and, and so many sayings. So what, what do you think, how does that impact young people and startups? I can tell you straight away to limit their growth. And I see a lot of them. See, I'll give an example. Uh, there's somebody I mentor, a lady, and I was uh, with her the last weekend, and I asked her a question. I said, so how is this business doing? No, I can see I'm doing very well. I'm doing quite well. So what next? So it's difficult to say what next. Because they can't see scale. Mm -hmm. So it's still, so it's like our, our fathers in those days doing subsistence farming. Mm -hmm. But there's a way to go full scale, mechanized. Mm -hmm. So it, most of the business are like that. They're, they're subsistence businesses. You are making money. You can buy a new wristwatch, buy a phone, buy a car, pay your rent. But there's more to business than just those things. Mm -hmm. Anybody who has a salary can do that. Mm -hmm. Entrepreneurs are meant to do more than that. Mm -hmm. So most of them will not be able to scale. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that is the end. Mm -hmm. But they should be inquisitive. Now, I also take the fact that many people have to start because there are no jobs. So in my own case, I said I went back to pay the employment because there was a job. I mean, there was no job. What would I have done? So if you don't have a job, you can't just sit in one place. You have to get going. Mm -hmm. But when you get going, you must understand your limitations mm -hmm. and continue to ask yourself certain questions. I think there's this book I read, Management of Objectives, mm -hmm. by a guy called George Odeon. He's late now. Uh, he said that people get so involved in their day-to-day -day activities that they begin to forget the reason for those activities. They call it activity trap. In other words, you started a business. There must have been a reason why I started the business. At some point, one year, two years, three years, four years, you need to stop and ask yourself, what next? Am I achieving what I wanted to achieve? Otherwise, the idea of buy, sell, make money, spend it, buy, sell, make money, spend it, it could be a vicious cycle mm. and you can't get out of it. Mm. So the ability to slam your, your feet on the brakes and say, okay, hold on, I've done this for three years, four years, what next? Mm. I mean, if you're doing business and COVID struck, it gives you an, a sense for what can go wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that fear of what can go wrong should propel you to be able to look for other things that you can do to future proof what you are doing currently. Mitch, clearly, uh, one of your most famous phrases, uh, and I'm sure if we ask your colleagues, they will confirm this, is what next? You, you've said it so many times, and, and you've given us an insight, even for you personally, what will come next. But we are still on the past something that intrigues a lot of people you mentioned in passing you started into switch it was an idea you didn't have money can you tell us a bit more of the story how much was used to start into switch okay. what was the journey like and today young people is all about start raise money do a minimum viable product do a pilot, raise more money, better version, go live, another round, 
and then so many series of fundraising. What was your journey like? Okay, so I'll tell you my journey, but do not take that to me that if I was to do it all over again, I'll do the same I did it before. Like I said before, it's a function of time and season, okay? When we started the Intel Switch, there was no venture capitalist that you can approach. And we didn't know of any. Okay? So at that point, either you have savings, friends and family, or you, you are bold enough to go and take a loan from the bank. If you save by the bank, I'll give you the loan. So for me, the way Intel Switch started was, I wasn't really trying to start Intel Switch. You know, you know the story. I was staff of Ternet, heading business development, and I needed to meet my targets. And there was competition in everything we were doing. We were selling Cisco routers, everything. So becoming a, a red ocean. And I realized that, okay, there's something else we could do as Ternet then that we're not doing. So let's go to payments. And then I went with this technology to the existing payment companies and nobody wanted to buy. And I had a target to meet. So I said, okay, why not create a company to buy from me and meet the target? So that's how Intersuit was created. So I've started it now, met the target. The question is, what next? So I suddenly realized that there's a lot of plan that we to start a business. So you can sell a product to a company and they buy it. Now they have a what next? So I started the process of trying to create Intersuit. I was basically doing two jobs. I had my job in Telnet that I was sent, that was being paid for. And there was this one that I was sending myself that nobody was paying me for. You know, so I tried to combine both. And then at some point, um, stroke of luck, I spoke to HOV, my CEO then, uh, connected me with uh, Shegwo Lijobi of Accenture, who was his friend. Told them what I had in mind. At that time, Accenture was consulted for First Bank. Uh, Dr. Suleiman told First Bank what he had heard. Uh, the then CEO of First Bank was interested. We had a meeting. And that's how it started. And the next thing was okay, we didn't want it to be an issue for one bank. Let's get one other bank involved. So the MD of First Bank called the MD of Union Bank then. Okay, that was interested. Uh, my group MD, Dr. Dele, then had sent a document to an director of UBA and mistakenly put my presentation inside. I mean, like, so I said, ah, what is this thing on about? Why are we not involved? You be got involved. <laughs> so that's how I started. Then the question was, where's the money to start? So we went, did a business plan, and the business plan was for about 400 million naira, and uh, which was a lot of money there, to be honest. But luckily for us, the central bank had told the banks to keep aside a certain amount of their profits to support entrepreneurial ventures like this one. I think they call it the, the, the Smith Fund, the Small Media Enterprises Fund. And then there was a requirement that it cannot be more than 200 million. So we needed 400 million, but we're going to get 200 million. So we got 200 million, which is roughly $500,000 today to start the business. Okay? If you wanted 450 million and really get 200, you have to begin to scale things down quickly. So we had to scale back a lot of things. By the time we finished getting this building, where we are now, bought our servers, everything, we had less than 50 something million that are left. And then I realized that we didn't have enough money to pay salaries for the next two years. And I didn't want to borrow. So we started, we, we now pivoted. So instead of building the infrastructure, we started selling payment solutions to banks and building products for them, you know? So that's how, by the following year, we were profitable doing IT work. Mm. So the, the trick was to take IT work, let projects shrink, mm. and let transactions grow. Mm. So that was the balancing act we were doing. Mm. So we're doing IT work. In pay payment space. In payment space. So just payment space. We, we, we're very focused. Mm. But we're getting money. We're being paid. So we're raising money because we're being paid. Mm. And we're making sure that we're not spending more than we're making. Mm. And we're actually saving. Mm. Okay? It goes back to the point I made before that money is like blood. We didn't have too much. And we didn't have too little. We were just getting enough to get going. Depending when our original business, which is switching, will grow. Yeah. And by the time we started doing that, we saw realized that by year two, the company was profitable. Mm. And we've remained profitable since then. So we never really had to raise money, mm. borrow money. Mm. The only money we have borrowed 
was the bond we raised uh, about a few years ago for a special project. Um, when you hear that um, private equity came in, we were basically buying the shares of shareholders. So we basically used that $500,000 to create, I mean, if you go back to where we became a unicorn, to create a billion. Mm -hmm. So to your question, therefore, what is the right model? Okay. I have the crystal ball to tell you what that is. You see, there are different times where we started. I mean, the way we started then and the opportunities we have may be different. Now, now there's money out there. So I'm not surprised that people are raising rounds of money because they need it to grow. But my view has always been know where you come from. Nigeria is not Silicon Valley. Okay? This is Savannah. And the, the games, the way you play the game in, in Silicon Valley and the way you play the game in the Savannah will, will not necessarily be exactly the same. So don't copy the rules of a particular place and try to apply it here. You need to think about your environment and try to balance things. So I still believe that at the end of the day, every business needs to be pro provide a service that somebody is willing to pay for and the person is willing to pay at a price point that allows you to cover your costs. Mm -hmm. and you make a profit. Mm -hmm. is up to you. In our case, we rushed to it mm -hmm. because we knew that was able to test and convince ourselves that we were up to something good. Mm -hmm. The moment we were able to raise money, we were able to use that money we raised from our operations to keep reinvesting and then basically grow the business. Which, let, let me paraphrase and then ask the question. Is it safe to say that what you're saying in essence is that uh, you sold the story of InterSwitch to a number of people as soon as you got funding and you got started, you put your business plan aside for a while, completely put it in the drawer, raised enough money to get going, and after a year or two, pulled it out after it's gathered some dust, and then began to look at it. That's the way to look at it. You see, you cannot say you want to embark on a journey and you have fuel for half the journey and you just start off and start going you have to recognize that you have fuel for just half so part of your strategy will be how do I get additional fuel so in our case we need for 50 million we only got 200 million what do you do you have to think of other ways you have to pivot to something else so we had skills don't forget we have built a switch what happened in the case of interns is that we went to South Africa with a few staff sat down there built the switch learnt it built it dismantled it, came back and we built it again. So we had some IT skills. And that skill was needed by the banks. Don't forget many years ago, most, most, most banks couldn't drive ATMs. It's a no-brainer today, but then it was a big issue. So we had that skill, so we started putting that skill to use. So we're doing IT work. Do the work, get paid, keep the money, do the work, get paid, keep the money, and then reverse the money to go to business. And that's basically what we did. So there's, I don't know of any strategy or any business that says I'm going up north, that does not face obstacles. At some point, you need to go east or west. Sometimes even go back down south to be able to go back up north. It's never that straight. If it was that straight, everybody would be, be in business. So you're going to find, face up sort of challenges. You have to deal with different challenges. It's like you are going somewhere, your, your village has told you that there's going to be one epidemic that the way to solve that epidem epidemic is to go to one distant place and bring what's called mm -hmm. that is sitting on a, on, a, on a mountain somewhere mm -hmm. but they tell that the road is very dangerous mm -hmm. so you're going people if you miss obstacles you fight mm -hmm. conquer them you don't conquer them and go back you conquer them and you continue mm -hmm. so no there's no road that's ever smooth yeah you do what you need to do and you keep going until you get to wherever you are you, you, okay you uh, uh, Mitchell, go. before we go up north from, from this point uh, i want to ask one, one more question around you know uh, the pitch from your story clearly as a much younger man you put an idea together and you got the attention of these top CEOs of the top banks in Nigeria it's like today a young man fresh out of school a few years putting an idea together and getting the attention of still top CEOs and top fintech CEO like yours, yeah. that's a tough order to cross in today's time, at the same time. So what exactly did you tell them? 
I mean, what problem did you tell them you were going to solve? How did you get their attention? Okay, so thinking back, no two companies got the same pitch. I, I remember the pitch to First Bank very well because that one I had to pitch. I can also tell you the pitch to Universal Trust Bank, that was the fund that is a smaller bank. And I can tell you the pitch to Ladi Baloko when he was in FCMB. I told you what was relevant to your business, but that was relevant to what I was trying to do. And I'll give an example. If you remember, when we started, GSM had just started, um, Nitel was to be sold. First Bank had tried to fund um, the the, one of the one of the one of the companies I I L also I can't yeah. remember the name and it did quite go well and the First Bank supported Connect Wireless mm -hmm. for a bank so my reason was that for a bank to be so wanted to get involved in telecoms there must be something they see about telecoms and their business so I had to go and find out what it was and I saw it quickly is that a bank can use telecommunications what would not call mobile as a channel a cheap channel to reach its customers and that was the vision first bank had so do what i kid into it all i need to do was show to first bank in their retreat the role the which can play in helping them achieve that vision i was able to tie to first bank the connection between banking and mobile if you recall later, that was 20 years ago yeah later we went to create glow m Banking, yeah. where Global.com provided the network and First Bank provided the card. Mm -hmm. We call it Glow First. Mm -hmm. That today is what you call a person. Mm -hmm. But fortunately for us, one of the parties did not develop it. Mm -hmm. So that would have been a person where a bank and a telco were united. Providing financial and services. And that thing worked for a very long time yeah. until one of the partners went, you know. Mm -hmm. The pitch to UTB, Universal Trust Bank, then was very different. And the pitch to Ladi Balogo was different. The pitch to Ladi Balogo was the same. I need, I don't want people to see this thing as something for the big banks. I want mid sized bank also to be part of it. And I know you, you know us. FCMB are the closest to the tenant group. We know this already. Right? Like, so that was the pitch. No, it has nothing to do with anything other than a moral suasion to join. Mm -hmm. Of course, Laji being a very smart guy, mm -hmm. knew how his bank could, could leverage it. Yeah. So the point I'm trying to make is that there's no single pitch for every potential investor. They all have different views. Mm -hmm. You need to do your homework to find out what matters to them mm -hmm. and show how your organization that you're trying to create mm -hmm. can bridge that gap and help them grow. Now that is a bit to be speak. Yeah. Again, if you are dealing with investors, it's a different story. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just let you know, there's just one, not one single deck. Mm -hmm. There are different decks mm -hmm. for different um, stakeholders. Yeah. Stakeholder. Now let's come a bit northwards uh, from from the description you gave earlier. So in today's startup ecosystem, there is, like you pointed out, a lot of emphasis on fundraising, and why not? The funds are available. Uh, What's your take? You already said you can have too much money, it's like having too much blood. So, what's your take on what is or how should startups measure the exact amount of money they should be looking for? Uh, you know, today, before a number of startups start, they are looking for a million dollars, half a million dollars, two million dollars. They have their highest set of into switch, taking into switch out, some of them. And, and a number of them are you know, doing a good job at coming close, isn't it? So, how much should startups seek to raise? You know, and how do they know they are really raising too much money? Um, I don't have a clear answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, for many reasons. The world then is different from the world now. Mm -hmm. But there are some basic principles. First, you cannot be the company on the basis of valuation. It goes against everything I, I know and I think of. It, it starts from what impact do you want to make? What problem are you trying to solve? Okay? 
how big is that problem and what amount of capital therefore do I need to solve that problem that's where I will drive it from okay now once you dimension that you know what you need to do and of course I don't think like I said before every business needs to go to show at some point no matter their strategy you use that you're able to keep customers who really believe in your service who are willing to pay you a certain amount of money for that for that service and that money so that you are efficient enough for you to cover your costs and for you to keep something on the side for yourself which is called profit mm -hmm. that to be the ultimate goal now there are two schools of thought there are those like in our case that rush to profitability mm -hmm. to prove that yes you have a viable business model and then we began to grow from there and there are those who say okay let's get all the customers first and then we'll try and see how we can convert them to fee paying customers down the line it appears both work mm. of, uh, if, you, if it doesn't work you won't be doing it mm. so i think every entrepreneur will have to figure out what is ideal mm. for their situation mm. and go after it again if tomorrow for whatever reason something happens in the world and capital is not coming to africa you have to pivot your business to a model that will make you continue to sustain your growth and if capital is always there and it's easy to get why not go for it mm -hmm. so i don't think there's a right or wrong answer to this let your situation determine and the environment you are in determine the best approach that you use Let, let's think about one more thing uh, with, with a lot of startups uh, you you since into switch have been with the company 20 years and and the impact to you personally, those were your opening remarks, and the company to the community or to the society are obvious. Um, we do know, I do know, that a, a good number of colleagues that started with you are still in the group, one playing one role or the other. How important is the team a startup starts with? First question. And then, how should you keep that team and for how long? What, what is the importance of such keeping a winning team as long as you can? Okay, thank you, Bosso. So, it starts with a vision. You rally people around the vision. We didn't start in terms of by saying we want to make money or want to, want it to be a unicorn. We didn't start from there. We all went to school here. As students, I know the number of students I heard died going home to get money from their parents and they had an accident. Okay? That problem was there. You know one of them. You know? Right? Yeah. We know as students how difficult it was to pay fees. So they just said that did not make sense. And so if you want to solve that problem, you can call a, call a group of people together who see that problem, who genuinely want to solve that problem, and who derive joy from seeing that that problem has been solved. So it goes back to operation. So in the case of InterSwitch, it was not about let's start a company. It is let's fix one, two, three, four problems in Nigeria. Let that be our contribution. And let's be single-minded about it. So naturally, I call friends, people I know, we are keen to that dream, okay? There's a very interesting story. There's a lady, uh, Oreme, if you look at my ID card, I'm staff number two. She's staff number one. <laughs> why? She beat it. Today. Yeah, why? <laughs> I was still project managing the business when I realized that we couldn't afford to lose her. Mm. I liked her spirit, her character, everything. And I felt that's the kind of person we need for the business. Mm. She had gotten a job with one of the air companies, I think. And she was going to go. I had to quickly give her a payment letter, even before I was employed. <laughs> so the message is, people who keep to the vision, people who have character. Mm. Like I usually say to people, I don't care what you know, mm. okay, it is who you are that really matters. It is not, uh, it's not just that I achieve results, but how you achieve the results also is critical. Mm. So if you have those kind of people, mm. when troubles come, they recognize that they've not achieved the goal, mm. and they stay on. Mm -hmm. So to me, that is the biggest thing. It is far that they know what we stand for, and we remain true to it. Twenty years down the line, we remain true to it. Interest has a strategy of what we call live and let live. Mm -hmm. 
So when you said that that competition coming in, wanting to kill Inter Switch, I just laughed. I said that must be a joke. Mm. You want to kill a colleague that's been there for 20 years that enabled your growth. Mm. Let me explain to you what live and let live means. We took a decision deliberately in Inter Switch that will make our infrastructure open to competition. So it's a deliberate strategy. Let me explain to you what it means. It came out of a realization that one company cannot solve the problems of Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't make sense for... And Africa, yeah, yeah. African countries. And it doesn't make sense for you to expect every new company to go back and start from where you started from. They should continue from where they met you and accelerate growth. Mm -hmm. So that was why from the one, we made our infrastructure open to everybody. It's like building a road and say nobody else can use the road, only your own boss. Mm -hmm. No, we said, okay, we'll build the road, anybody can use the road. Mm -hmm. Verve, MasterCard, Visa, use the road. We'll not discriminate. Mm -hmm. But I want to reserve the right to own a bus service just in case the bus operators are not doing a good job. Yeah. I want to go in. And I also want to reserve the right to pull back if suddenly they're doing a good job. Mm -hmm. Because the objective is for people to do a good job so we all benefit. And move people from point yeah. A to point so B on the road. I do not safely. know of any fintech in this country that started without connecting to InterSwitch at one time or the other. They may not be there today, but I cannot think of any that started. If you look at most of the fintechs, there are people who, some of them left InterSwitch to join those companies. And they are contributing very well. Some of them are doing very well. So that is what gives us joy. It's not the, it's not, it's not, it's not the, yeah, we are making money, no doubt about it, don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. It's a very profitable business, we are doing okay. But it is the impact mm -hmm. and the fact that two or three other companies employ staff, those staff have families, families are doing well, children are being born, they are going to school, and somehow we contributed to that. That's what gives us joy and that's what keeps a lot of us in the company. Okay, Mitchell, uh, still, still on startups, real quick. Mm -hmm. there are a lot of young people, uh, and this is a bit common with, with young people now. They, they start an idea and they make a number of robots, and you see them switch. Uh, maybe it's a bit of your influence. They, they switch from one, <laughs> from one project to another. Um, you talk to somebody, it's, it's on some, or she, or they, on some initiative now, six. 18 months down the line, sometimes even response. Um, they're talking about something and say, oh, oh, what about? So, you know, what do you think? Is it focus? Is it vision? Is it the resilience that's not there? What, what, uh, what's causing that and how should you be addressed? Okay, I, I don't have a clear answer. Each one has to be looked at in its own merits, but I can tell you something for sure, as this is what I believe in. If you, if you know one of my favorite quotes, is when the facts change, I change my mind. Mm. It's a quote by I think some economist, Sir John Maynard Keynes. Okay, I think the guy behind this Keynesian theory yeah. in economics. When the facts change, you change your mind. So if I am back on the journey and I realize that the model I'm using is wrong, even I've raised money, I owe myself, my workers, my shareholders. The duty of explaining to them that I think we made a mistake. Let us pivot to something else. We did. We did that. That's a conversation I don't want to have with you because this is a public forum. Mm. I mean, there were, there were discussions we had at the board when a few weeks into when, I, when you said I dropped the business plan. Mm -hmm. Yes, I did. And I remember having the, the conversation at the board then. And one of my directors was very upset with me. What kind of company is this? Just a few weeks ago, you told us to invest in this business. This is what you told us. And now you are just something else. The facts have changed. I suddenly realized that the business plan was wrong mm -hmm. and the opportunity lies somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And we have to go for it. Mm -hmm. We went for it and we came back to original plan. Mm -hmm. So I think people should not be slave to their decisions. Mm -hmm. But they must recognize that the decisions they take will impact on others. So they have to engage those people and explain mm -hmm. why they need to pivot things, why they need to change and get their buy-in and support mm -hmm. and they make it happen. Mm -hmm. Well, th thank you so much. Now, let, let's look at it about the environment for, for, for a moment. Um, starting out in Nigeria for you today, uh, well, we're focusing about your journey, not into switch. But today we know 
the organization you lead is in what half a dozen African countries? Well, five, but up to thirty something countries. Yes, yeah, so you have offices exactly. in five countries, but well, active in thirty yeah, yeah. something countries. Uh, what was the environment? You, you know, for a lot of people who are not in Nigeria, uh, diaspora, young tech players. Uh, I think there is a stat that says uh, about one out of two of the new startups that are successful in Nigeria has someone who either live abroad, study abroad, and so on. Uh, when they look at the country and indeed the continent from outside. All they see are policy landmines. How did you navigate those policy somersaults? And, and I don't want to use the word hostile, but you know, a lot of people perceive that the policy environment in most African countries uh, are hostile. Okay. Um, what, what did you do? You avoid their government. <laughs> you help, you lobby them to change the policy, you ignore the policy. Well, what did you do? Okay, let me start with a mistake I made. I ignored the regulator initially. It was a very costly mistake. I will not advise anybody to ignore the regulator. Regulators have an objective. To be a regulated business, they have an objective, and you need to understand the objective and see how you can support them. And they need to know you are supporting them. I used to think that just do your job and you'll be fine. It doesn't work that way. The regulators know what they are doing, what is that job they are doing, how does that job support them? That is issue number one. On the issue of opportunities and alignment, I actually feel do you know what it means to overcome a big problem? The feeling you get. That is the way I see those challenges in Nigeria. Those are the things that actually keep me going. That is where the excitement comes from. That's what gives me a kick. I told I, I have told my colleagues time and time again, I wonder I'm gonna write a book. And I'm going, to, I'm going to call it maybe the last 20 days, okay? And each day is one year. Mm. And I can tell you that in every year, I've been in little switch. We've had one major issue that year, enough to kill the business. Mm. But when we overcome it, the feeling you get prepares you for the next. There's this book, there's this uh, theory, the Grainer Growth Model. If you don't look at check it out. It says that companies go through six stages of growth. Okay? There's the six stages of evolution and five stages of revolution. Okay? Evolution and revolution. revolution. Every revolution can kill you. But once you overcome it, you get into an evolution phase, the growth phase again. So every growth is followed by something that can kill the business. You need to prepare for it. So we will complain about landmines. If you are in war, you should expect landmines. You need to prepare for it. Don't say it will not be there. It, if, I have to anticipate, if, I, if it's not there, you should start getting worried. That's the way we look at it. But let me just quickly drop something now. Something that I think a lot of entrepreneurs need to understand. About Six or seven years ago, during my global CEO program, the first day was in Brazil. There was a model in Brazil, a model in China, a model in Europe. In the model in Brazil, I remember a, a prof of economics telling us that by 2050, Nigeria will be one of the top 10 countries in the world. And I laughed it off. This Nigeria that we know. How can mm -hmm. is it possible? Then a few years ago, I was at a conference somewhere where Bismarck Rewani okay. said, used a data point, I think from the Economics Pocket Book or so. That particular year, Nigeria had was number one globally for what they call um, owner manager businesses. Okay. Meaning that the country where a lot of people end up having their own business is yes, yeah. Nigeria. I kept that data point somewhere. Then in the midst of COVID, and just last year, I saw an article by, I think, PwC, where they basically said that by 2050, Nigeria will be number 14. So this time around, I started to pay attention. Number 14. Number 10. Number 10. There must be some correlation. Now, one of the things that PwC article said something about discounting the impact of government. In other words, they're saying that Nigeria moved to number 14 because of the entrepreneurial spirit of Nigerians. 
Then I went back to what Mr. Patrick when he said. Mm. When you connect the dots, it gives mm. you a picture mm. where you see every problem in Nigeria as an opportunity for growth that no other country in the world will give to you as a black man. Okay? And people need to understand this. You move around, a lot of the new businesses you are seeing either be started by Indians or Chinese or Lebanese. What are they coming here to do? So one of the learning points from that article from the prof in Brazil was that when you have a population of close to 400 million, mm -hmm. which is where we project Nigeria to be by 2050, mm -hmm. there is nothing they are going to produce that will not sell, even if it is terrible. So just we used to hear made in China, made in India, and it was negative. Mm -hmm. And now made in China is not necessarily negative, or made in just negative. You will hear made in Nigeria, it will be negative initially, but with 400 million people, it's just a matter of time, all those negative things will become positive. Mm -hmm. Okay? So I just asked myself, where are the proof points? If this is going to be true, what are the proof points out there? Proof point number one, I went back. Which are the top banks today in the country? They were started by individuals. Okay? Meaning that a few years ago, there was an opportunity and some individuals were bold enough to tread where nobody else could tread. And today, they run the biggest banks in the country. There's opportunity somebody is building a refinery mm -hmm. nigerians are doing things that countries do that the government will carry out mm -hmm. because of this entrepreneurial spirit so when you look at it therefore insecurity has a solution mm -hmm. it has a solution even if it's not coming from government private security outfit will rise up to the task because the opportunity is there mm -hmm. so i think for me the the, the country the continent it's a continent of, of opportunities and we should as Nigerians not see or as Africans not see all those challenges those landmines as deterrents we just have to learn to manage despite these challenges mm. and the rewards tends to be huge mm. because there are not many countries in the world today where you can find the kind of lack of productivity that we have and the potential to really grow any endeavor that you're back for. Mitch, let, let me thank you. As we move towards the last quarter of this uh, interview, I, I'll pivot and, and take on some of the comments and questions from, from the audience. Uh, th there are a number of questions that are probing into Switch itself. I, I'd like to at this point say that this interview is a series uh, we're extreme Mitchell learning from his wealth of experience. We would have a follow-up session where we'll look more closely at into switch. But one of the points here, uh, people are interested in technology. They want to know your perspective about the next call, the next big way. So uh, the, I'll take two, 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 two things together. There's the perspective of metaverse. Someone is wanting to know the metaverse is everything now, kids, businesses, MTN announced the other day that they are, well, there was something in the news that they were getting virtual land in, in, in Metaverse. Uh, what's your view of Metaverse? And then digital currency is another question that people are asking around technologies and, and the future for you, for your entrepreneurial journey, and maybe some insight of thinking of InterSwitch, if you may. No, because this is a public forum. Huh? <laughs> I, I've already answered this question in my head in Pigeon English. <laughs> eh? With your permission, if you don't mind. Yeah, that's fine. Person never chop if they tell her I'm off. Metaverse is not my problem. Mm. It's not, it's not an issue for me right now. You see, you, you, you want to own land in Metaverse, you know, you not own land in, uh, in uh, Aja. We have more serious issues that I worry about. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying these things will not, they will, they will do well. But where we are today as a country, as a continent, the problems are more germane. Mm -hmm. Food security is an issue. Mm -hmm. Healthcare is an issue. So the way I see it, uh, many years ago, you would go to a bank and queue up, collect a number just to get your cash. Mm -hmm. Okay? There are many, my children don't go to the bank. 
that they will not believe that 20 years ago, just 20 years ago, we have to queue for hours. We have to queue for hours. When you leave the office to see you are going to the bank, you don't come back. Banks are advertising banking services, showing how people don't go to queue up with math anymore. Mm. Okay? Mm. Now, we have seen what that has done to banking and payments. Our challenge right now is why is cash still king? So be careful about dropping onto technologies. Okay, let me explain. There's this thing that Gartner does, they call it the hype curve. Yeah. Every technology has a hype that comes with it. Mm. Then you get into what they call the trough of disillusionment before it takes off. I think as far as technology is concerned, Africa should position as a fast follower. Not a leader. No, not a leader. We must deal with our fundamental issues and keep an eye on what the world is doing and see how those technologies yeah. play out and can help us accelerate our development. So, but I would say that if I was to pick something that excites me, it would be blockchain. Okay? I'm, Metaverse is good, but I'm still trying to understand what it means. Okay? But blockchain, I understand. I wish there were ways to improve transportation mass transportation in Nigeria, the payment experience. I wish there were ways to improve the payment experience in healthcare. I want to go to the hospital with all the problem of I, I'm not feeling well. I don't want to think about payments. You get into Uber, you enjoy the rights. You don't worry about payment. When you finish, payment is taken. It should be seamless. If we can digitize most of those other sectors, things will happen. So if I were to pick one technology, I'll just say blockchain for now. But let's be careful. Even blockchain itself was a hype many years ago. It's not we are going to find proper use for it. So a lot of the audience wants you to shed a bit more light. You mentioned that you made a mistake. You ignored regulatory bodies for, for quite a bit. But now uh, I want to believe your relationship with them is a lot better. When someone is asking, how do you navigate your relationship with regulatory bodies, especially when it is known that they've caused the end of a lot of businesses? So what exactly should you do? Is it just to keep See, an eye on them? You, 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 that, that, is, that is not the first statement. Like I told you, I made a mistake. You mm -hmm. see, put yourself in the mind of the regulator. Mm -hmm. Why were you created? The regulators are created to protect the larger community not to keep businesses. I repeat, regulators are created to protect the larger community, not to kill the small community. Now, that small community needs to understand why regulators exist and seek to know their minds. What are they thinking of? And help them with models that can allow them to protect the larger community and foster growth. You must engage. Mm -hmm. So when I said I made a mistake, I was running away from the regulator. I thought the less they saw me, the better for me. I didn't want their wahala. But you see, if you are systematically important, you can't run away. Now you can see what's happening in Russia. Mm -hmm. No payments, no banking, no transfers. Imagine if that happened here. Mm. The chaos would be huge. Mm. And somebody is going to be held accountable mm. for that area because we created you to regulate that area. What are you doing? Mm. So I think we, we should stop seeing regulators eh, as people who are out there to kill. Mm. That's not their job. Their job actually, they are actually happy where you grow. Mm. But you also must learn how to support them because they have a mandate. And your actions should not be seen to be going against their mandate. Mm. I'll give you an example. Somebody is trying to deal with currency issues. Yes, there are many ways you can deal with it. But it doesn't mean that you should make it more difficult. So there must be engagement. Mm. Okay? Now, don't get me wrong. I, I, I can't just go to CBN and say, for example, I want to see you. Even some of us will struggle with that engagement. But I'm just saying I've learned mm. 
that you must continue to make that effort to engage. But that is the only way. You, can, you guys have come to alignment. They want you to do well, but they also have a mandate. You need to help them achieve that mandate. Yeah, themselves. absolutely, Mitchell. It, it makes a lot of sense. Again, we're, we're Africans, and if you look at it, as a regulator, you are a king over a small space. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes more sense to be lord over a lot of strong and mighty warriors than a, a number of small midgets who yeah. deliver nothing. Yeah. So, it's in the interest of regulators to make sure the regulated are, are, are big and successful, they grow and so on. Now, Mitch, um, you mentioned about ecosystem earlier. What next? You know, I told you I was going to come back to what next. The way you spoke, if I have a little bit of a crystal ball, which you say you don't have, you said that a number of times, it will seem to me that your mind is set on setting up or being part of an ecosystem, a startup ecosystem you want to support, you want to fund, you say you want to put in your money. So uh, are you involved right now in, in any funding or support structure? I know you did say you men mentor you know, someone at least. So do you have a, a structure for the way we put it here, giving back? Even though what I mean is not really about giving back, but supporting the, the ecosystem. Yes, I am involved. Um, again, I'm trying to personalize it now. I'm trying to get into interest rate conversation. Mm. Many years ago, interest rate created a growth fund. And we invested in two companies. They didn't do well. The, 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 the Wahala to track our investment was just too much. And we realized that it's not interest rate's job. Okay? I would like that money to a P firm or somebody else to do that job. But it's a full-time job, and our full-time job was not that. But we tried to help the ecosystem grow. But it didn't quite pan out. We lost that money, okay? Uh, so it's not that I have competence, basically. Personally, there are certain areas that excite me. Like I told you, I see myself as the product of the benevolence of others, okay? Mm -hmm. So I want to play a similar role. So what I do, I look for individuals and I plant them. And I bank them in different areas. I don't limit to technology because my objective is not money, it's for those people to make impact. So I'm backing people in farming. I'm just on farming right now. So I have a farm. Got some young guys. I'm able to be farm once, but we've invested, I've sold, I've made money. So I've only been there once because the job is not to be there, it's to teach them models that will help them grow. Um, so I have a farm. I'm doing a bit of real estate too, okay? Just to try different models to help some young guys. Of course, technology is there. So on that basis, I do that. Now, but more important for me, I'm a part of Endeavor, where we basically give our time and resources to help young entrepreneurs grow, okay? And they have access to you. So Endeavor does organize some sessions for me to meet some of these youngsters and share my perspective and ask questions. Some of them have access to me, they come in from time to time, we have mentoring sessions, they ask questions, they think their challenges, I guide them and so on and so forth. So all of this is that geared towards um, the startup ecosystem. Th thanks, Mitchell. So in closing, the, if you look back on, on your journey, you, you mentioned earlier that if you were to do this all over again, you may not do it exactly the same way. What exactly would you change? So, a few months back, I told my son, I saw something somewhere, and I said it to my son, that as you get older, you become more productive. Mm -hmm. And he, he argued with me. <laughs> so he was arguing from the point of view of, you are getting older, you don't have the energy, you, you don't have the energy, slower. how can you be more productive than me? And I told him, how old are you? With all the knowledge I've gathered running the business, okay? In fact, I said, you were born when I started Intel Switch. Mm. Do you know what I've gathered in that period? Mm. While you were in school, learning stuff, mm. I was on the streets of Lagos running a business. Mm. You think if I want to start a business with you, you can, you can compete? Mm. You can't. Because there are things that are just going to waste your time that I'll just ignore. Because experience has taught me this is a waste of time. There are ideas I see today, experience tells me, 
this guy has not told you. Just ask three or four or five questions and you can tell that this one has a lot of things to learn. Mm -hmm. The question would be, do you want to spend that time to help that person? The person that person is willing to learn, you can tell. Mm -hmm. Or do I just want to ignore the person, let the person go and try, make the mistakes and learn also on the job. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I think you should wait for that book to come out the last 20 days. Okay. Then I'll tell you what exactly I have learned. Because what I've tried to do, I've tried to make it small, easy to read, so that if you pick it up, in, in a few hours, you've gotten all the, all the lessons. Mm. Okay? So it's difficult to use this section to, 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 to deal with that. Yeah, to do with Th that. Thank you, Mitchell. F final question. Uh, Mitchell, globally, tech space, we know the technology companies are the most valued, these are things everybody knows. But it's about the barrier. They are pushing the envelope now into trillion dollar valuations. And about four, five, six companies are in that space already. Of course, in Africa, we're happy to have unicorns. And, and it's almost the goal of every startup, and, and, and that's the standard. Do you think that African tech startups will be pushing the button in our envelope to the double digit valuation in billion dollars anytime soon? Uh, are we likely to see an African company or companies valued at $100 billion and so on? The, 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 are we on course? The answer is yes. So let me give you an example. If you recall, when we became a unicorn, I had met a company during one of my devil uh, events in South Africa who had come to make a pitch, a lot of mention names. And one of the panelists asked this entrepreneur question, why are you coming here? You don't need money. So I asked him, why did you say that? And he told me this guy could easily be valued as this and I almost fell off my chair because at that time Intas was much bigger than that company we were profitable I mean they were a fraction but I couldn't make that I couldn't boast that Intas should be valued at this so the view is that a lot of companies in Africa are undervalued for many reasons it's not that they are pointing to currency devaluation they are pointing to Boko Haram somewhere they are always pointing to something to reduce the valuation so we felt that when we achieved a unique status that Maybe a lot of people pay attention, and I, I think I came in one of his uh, interviews. Did say that there will be a you, the rate at which you see unicorns coming out of Africa will increase, which yeah. we have seen less than a year. Mm. We have seen it. Okay, mm. so if you look at the fundamentals of growth, Africa is the by view the last frontier. Okay, very little money here can create a lot of growth because the pent up demand is there. These things, the kind of association you will find coming out of Nigeria or Africa will be such that if you compare it to others, if we have a more stable environment, we could easily achieve those kind of valuations too. Mitchell, I'd like to thank you for your time. Um, as we leave, uh, I'd just like to give you some feedback from some survey. We, we, we ran uh, a survey ahead of this interview and, and we asked our respondent a number of questions. Um, we, we ask them if they think you are championing the dominance of, of technology, fintech in, in Africa. Uh, I'm glad to let you know that 85% um, of the respondents think you are, that, that you are one of African champions of, of fintech. Uh, we, we asked uh, if the impact of you and InterSwitch on, on the fintech industry in Nigeria, the response is a bit stronger, almost 90%. So, out there people appreciate that uh, you've done quite a lot for, for the fintech space uh, no wonder CBN confirms uh, that you are systemically important uh, we, we asked again how much of a business leader how good a business leader do we think Mitchell is it's a little lower but just almost nearing 80% it's still very good score uh, so the, the impact of so what it means, which is what is expected, the impact of Mitchell and your colleagues gives him to switch a, a higher response. But this is still fantastic feedback for people. And, and finally, we, we ask if people if they think you are top five, top five business leaders in Africa. And a, a big majority of the people do agree that in, in Nigeria that you are clearly one of Nigeria's top five most influential 
business leaders in technology. Thank so you. on that note, Mitchell, I'd like to congratulate you on your journey. I'd like to thank you for the time you spent with us. And I'd like to tell our, our audience and friends that this is first of two series. We are coming back at a day to be announced soon uh, when we will be looking at the into switch journey. Uh, the focus for this has been a lot about the founder and CEO of Mitchell, but into switch as an enterprise, perhaps, who knows, unicorn, but what about the $10 billion valuation? How, how quickly can you get there? Uh, perhaps when we talk to you in a couple of weeks, we will uh, share some light on that. On that note, I would like to thank you for joining us. My name is Boswaini. I'm a director at Digital Africa. It's been our pleasure to host Mitchell Elebe, founder, CEO of Intersuite at this VIP series for Digital Africa. Please follow all our handles and all social media platforms for the video and we'll be happy to share this content with you. Startups in Africa, let's go out and do great things. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you.